Christmas day on the beach, y'all. <laughs> I am currently watching my entire family play hilariously in the water. Um, but because I am basically cat-like, I'm pretty much never interested in that. I'm instead devoting my life to more Heather-like things. <laughs> I'm currently reading a book called Unfamiliar Fishes by Sarah Vowell. And it's super good. It's like about how Hawaii came to be acquired by the United States. So it's like not like a happy story. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously a story about pretty brutal imperialism, um, but it's funny. Like, Sarah Vowell, she's so funny, and she's like writing this stuff that would generally be a bit dry, you know, like about all of these like missionaries who eventually kicked off this sort of movement to take Hawaii from the Queen and like turn it into a state. Um, <clears throat> but it's like not dry because she's hilariously lampooning them. Anyway, <clears throat> I've just got to a part where. Uh, she's talking about this tradition in like traditional Hawaiian culture where when you greet someone you like touch noses and breathe them in <laughs> and how like Hawaiian um, people, their word for white people is like a word that sort of goes down to breathless or like no breath or something basically because white people refuse to do this <laughs> she's like, uh, whenever she's tried it she just basically has two moves like headbutt someone and then breathe them in like a wheeze like <laughs> Um, anyway, really loving this book, really loving my location. Uh, all Christmases should be in Hawaii, folks. And this is why you have a large Catholic family, so that you can read while other people related to you watch your child. <laughs> and teach them to swim, which I have not done yet for my kid. <laughs> Lol, crap my kid brought me from the sea. The water's getting dangerously close. <laughs> Time to move back. Uh, so my book now is on about sort of the original Christian missionaries that went to Hawaii. Um, they're part of like a group of sort of, you know, overseas mission trip people. And um, they trained a lot to go to Hawaii and they brought like native Hawaiians with them and everything. And all of the training was about kapu and like making sure to meet the right people and act in the right way and everything. So then it takes them like months and months, like almost a year to get to Hawaii. They'd go all the way around Cape Horn, you know. Um, like they had to go all the way like around the southern horn bit anyway. Um, and then like they get there and some of the native Hawaiians go ashore to sort of ask to land, you know. Um, they come back with huge news, like everything that they had prepared themselves for is different. <laughs> like um, the king is dead, his son is fair, Kapu is kaput, <laughs> they've completely gotten rid of it as a system. All of these like idolatrous sort of religion type stuff that they had going on on the island beforehand, um, the current king has gotten rid of it all. <laughs> they've like burned the temples and everything and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it is sort of crazy that it came to an end that quickly. You know, if you have like the same system, the same like kapu system, and the same like, you know, gods and everything for like 1500 years or whatever, and then just all of a sudden overnight basically. Like, what happened was the king's like mother and stepmother, I guess, um, they were sort of in the habit with like all of these like white people coming, like sailors and everything, so it just sort of come to the island more and more. And um, they'd have like, you know, the royalty of the island be invited to have dinners on the ships with the sailors and everything. And like the men and women would eat together and like they wouldn't have any of these like kapu things. So um, <clears throat> in the end, the royalty were like, we don't want this anymore. And like the mother and the stepmother, as soon as the son, like Kamehameha, 
the original sort of king warrior guy. As soon as he died and his son became the king, um, the mother and stepmother were like, okay, so here's your first thing, get rid of Kapu. And then the son was like, okay. He not only got rid of Kapu, but just like burned all the temples. Like, okay, get rid of this religion, like overnight, basically. Um, but anyway, yeah. The book is basically on about how, like, the white missionaries coming was sort of the beginning of the end for Hawaiian culture and like Hawaiian independence. So, great. Because his generation wasn't coddled as much as subsequent generations. Yeah. Seriously. Well, I think it's extremely. Guys, how messed up is this? Okay. So. I've always wondered why it is that there's like a union flag, like a British flag, in the Hawaiian state flag. And like, um, it turns out that it's because, for some reason, the Hawaiians thought that they were a British protectorate for ages, when they weren't. <laughs> okay, so it says here, According to the Journal of Captain George Vancouver of the Royal Navy in 1794, Liholiho's father, Kamehameha, so the current king's dad, like the great warrior king Kamehameha, made the most solemn session possible of the island of Hawaii to his Britannic majesty. <laughs> Kamehameha and his chiefs, Vancouver wrote, unanimously acknowledged themselves subject to the British crown. For this, the captain gave the king a union jack. There is no record that the British government ever acknowledged receipt of the gift of Hawaii. That's how stuck up the British were. Whole archipelagos were handed to them, and they were too busy ruining continents to notice. <laughs> But the Hawaiians didn't know that. Kamehameha I and Kamehameha II believe they ruled a British protectorate. <laughs> this is the reason that the Hawaiian flag features a Union Jack. How crazy is that? <laughs> okay, so I'm like brushing my hair and getting ready and everything and reading a book. As you do. Um, and I came across this part of my book that I love. I just feel like this author's really good and like everything she sums up, she does really funny. I don't know, but she's like quite insightful as well and like, I don't know, like says things in a really nice, like cool way or whatever. Like, um, if I had to pick one Bible verse that students of American history should know, it is Act 69. Like, I'm not super Bible-y. This isn't like, you know, a Bible story. <laughs> It's about American history, I promise. <laughs> Not that the Bible's bad, I'm just, you know, like prefacing what this is about. So, um, that says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed to him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Um, in the middle of his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul had a dream or hallucination in which a Macedonian stranger pleaded for a preaching. Um, Paul dropped what he was doing in Asia Minor and immediately sailed across the Aegean. So then, so sort of later on, she's like explaining what she means. She's like, for Americans, Act 69 is the high fructose corn syrup of Bible verses. An all-purpose ingredient will stir into everything, from the ink on the Marshall Plan to canisters of Agent Orange. Our greatest goodness and our worst impulses come out of this missionary zeal, contributing to our overbearing yet not entirely unwarranted sense of our country as an inherently helpful force in the world. And as with the Apostle Paul, the notion that strangers want our help is sometimes a delusion. And she like talks about how so much of America and so many Americans were like powered by this, you know, this Bible verse. So it like goes on ships when they go on missionary work and stuff like that. Like America is just powered by it. Yeah. Holy crap, y'all. It's bananas on a tree. Like, this fish basically reminds me how, like, removed I am from nature that I think that they just show up in the supermarket. Uh, so there's quite a lot of aquariuming going on here, which is good for a view, but sort of boring. So I'll give you a bit of stuff from my book. Okay, so... There was this guy named David Mallow in the 19th century. He's like natively Hawaiian, but he's in with the missionaries. You know, he's Christian, he's like learned to read and write, and he's teaching everyone else to read and write and sort of like learn English and Christianity and everything. And like in the early days, he's really gung ho for it. You know, he's like, everything turns white, blah, blah, blah. But like as he gets older, he starts to get really worried because um, 
like Hawaiian culture is dying off faster than he meant for it to. And like uh, sort of white people start banning the speaking of Hawaiian in the schools and everything. So in like a letter to friends, he wrote, if a big wave comes in, large and unfamiliar fishes will come from the dark ocean. And when they see the small fishes of the shallows, they will eat them up. The white man's ships have arrived with clever men from the big countries. They know our people are few in number and our country is small. They will devour us. Then he died in 1853, and he was buried up on a mountain above, like, the school he taught at. Um, he says, on a slope where he hoped no white man would ever build a house. How depressing is that? Um, and the Hawaiian language, like, continued to be banned, um, until sort of, like, the 1960s, when it sort of started undergoing this, like, aggressive revival. And I'm sort of thinking, like, isn't that when all of the other sort of languages under sort of the Anglophone, like, heavy hands sort of started having their revival? Like, I think Welsh and Scottish languages as well sort of started... Um, sort of aggressively <laughs> revitalizing themselves at that time as well, so... Um, it's sort of got, like, actually a lot of things in common with Wales, which is a bit depressing, <laughs> but, um, there you go. It's like a dog. Holy shit, guys. This is the tomb of the woman I'm reading about in my book. Okay, wait, the book says, um, the queen mother, Kiopulani, was the highest ranking noble on all the land. Far fancier than her deceased husband, she was born to the uppermost caste of chiefs. Her parents had been siblings, and brother sister marriages were prized for concentrating a clan's spiritual mana or power. <laughs> Guys, what the hell day is it? Oh my god, I can't see at all. Like, is my head even like properly like in this? I'm just gonna talk to like basically a black screen and hope that it does something. <laughs> but um, I'm reading my book now on the beach. Other people are watching my kid. As you do. <laughs> and, um, it's really interesting here. Like they're all they're on about like uh, sort of the beginning of the end for Hawaii. Um, with the missionaries, like the white missionaries from America coming in. And um, what they did do, even though they like sort of hastened the end of like Hawaiian traditional culture. Um, what they did do is create a writing system for the Hawaiian language and then teach the people to read and write that language. So it says the Hawaiian people oh wait. Um, the Hawaiian people accomplished an absolutely incredible educational feat. They went from having no written language here on the islands to 75% of all Hawaiians learning to read and write in their native language, and that's between 1822 and 1863. Um, by the way, if you factor in slave population in the south of the United States in 1863, the literacy rate was roughly 40%. Western Europe had a literacy rate of about 65%, um, which means in about 41 years, Hawaii became one of the most literate nations on the planet as a percentage of its total population. <laughs> That's pretty damn good. Also, did you know that NASA lubed its moon landers with whale oil until 1986? What? Okay. I don't know. 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 I don't know.
Pacific coast and everything and to sort of like um, provide sort of capitalist things for them you know things that they want like sugar and stuff so it sort of like pushed the islands in Hawaii to sort of like make more sugar and like sort of fall more to like capitalist forces and stuff and led to this like um, decree that the king made where he wanted like um, to give away his land to the common people so that they could make money off it or whatever. Um, and because of like the legal issues of things, like making it hard for commoners to sort of know how to claim the land that they were farming and stuff like that as their own, um, it ended basically in just like a massive white people land grab. <laughs> that sort of still is like the way it is now, like the sort of white businesses and everything on all of them on the land. Um, and anyway, the Oregon Territory, for anyone who's not American or was asleep in history class in America, includes what will eventually become Seattle, Washington, which is where I'm from. So maybe I am tied to the Hawaiian Islands. <laughs> My, uh, you know, ancestors moving there uh, you know, eventually led to the sort of like takeover of Hawaii by white people. So, you know, proud of that. Um, also, for anyone who is Hawaiian, <laughs> I apologize. I realize the issue is much more complicated than how I'm saying it is. <laughs> I'm like simplifying it to a dangerous degree. I apologize for that. Just stop. You should, if you're like really interested in this, you should speak to someone who's Hawaiian. <laughs> Okay, so I was like looking at all these books and I was like, okay, so I'm only leaving like one or two books behind So I can only fit like one book basically in my bag like which one of these books should I get? And I said to my mom, I was like, mom, I only have room for one book. Which one should I get? And she was like, well, I have room in my bag if you want to stick one in and I was like <laughs> Well, that was not the answer I was looking for but now I'm definitely getting them both <laughs> oh, fuck. I love Target so much surfing um but i'm so close to finishing the book that i'm reading that i'm worried to leave without a backup book Very close to being done with this book. I only have a few pages left. They're on about like a stereotypically Hawaiian sort of food setup called the plate lunch, which is just like a crap ton of different kinds of food piled on a plate. And um, I remember ages ago when Barack Obama went back home like he's like from hawaii he was born in honolulu like he went back home for like a campaign stop or something and he said oh i can't wait to have plate lunch and i was like okay whatever but apparently the plate lunch came about in like the 19th century when they started like all the white people who owned the land in hawaii started really making money with um the sugar cane and everything 
and they brought in loads of different diverse groups of people in order to keep them from like organizing <laughs> like if they have nothing in common with each other they can't communicate with each other they can't understand each other in any way either through language or through culture they won't be able to sort of like form a union <laughs> how messed up is that like eventually basically they all just started mating with each other made friends anyway um, and just made a really diverse like population base and created the plate lunch so that's exciting <sighs> I'm having a really hard time even like processing the idea of plate lunch we all went to like this Indian food buffet thing tonight and I am full also it's so hot and the surfing today was so hard I could just sleep nailed it y'all finished it it's all done one of the very sort of last pages as it's talking about stuff um it says about the last queen of Hawaii after she was forced to sort of sign over sovereignty and she was imprisoned and everything and sort of tricked into doing stuff it says I wonder what she would have thought if she had known witnessing that inaugural parade that 112 years later the first Hawaiian born president of the United States would be inaugurated and in his parade the marching band from the Punahou school his alma mater and that of her enemies it's like um there were two schools, the school for the chiefs of Hawaii and the school for the sort of um, missionaries kids, like the white kids. And that was the Punahou school. Um, would serenade the new president by playing a song she had written, the Aloha Oi song, you know? Aloha Oi, Aloha Oi. She wrote that song. Anyway, I absolutely loved this book. It was so good. I especially love reading books like this in the place where they're about because um, as we're sort of wandering around Lahaina in Maui a couple days ago, I kept sort of encountering all the places that she was talking about in the book. Um, so that's one of my favorite things. But anyway, I'm now moving on to The Descendants by Cowie Hart Hemmings. Definitely don't know how to say that. Um, but this one actually, like, I did see the movie. And it's about this, like, rich guy who's a descendant of the sort of first rich white guys on the island. So it carries on quite perfectly from the book I just read. Ugh. Couldn't have been better if I planned it. Right. So, now, in the final act of everything for today, is to go and stick this book in the <laughs> bookshelf pile here in the condo so that someone else can read it. <laughs>